in Netherlands who invented an instrument which was like a telescope and he thought that the instrument could be very very useful for astronomy and he modified that instrument to observe planets okay and he could see the phases of Venus and that was a that was a uh, major achievement in astronomy why because normally when you are inside uh, on the earth and you are looking at the sky you are having getting a 2d view of the sky right you have only theta phi it's like a 2d coordinate okay but even with telescope you, you are actually limited to 2d but in some sense when you observe the phases it becomes 3d this is because if the sun is at the center and the planet is going around it you can imagine that there is a light bulb here and there let's say there is a ball here the shadow is going to move around right so if you observe such a system from a distance you know that uh, if, even if you look at the edge on view that means the ball is here let's say the light is here and the uh, ball is here so you see a one dimensional something like a simple harmonic oscillation right because you are looking at one dimension but if you see the phase the shadow then you know that the actually it is not one dimensional it is like this thing is going at two dimension okay so when you are looking from this point at this side you also have the depth so which is the third dimension when you are looking at the sky there is no third dimension right because it's just 2d it's a sphere but when you get the depth that is the r coordinate then you have the third third dimension so in some sense this instrument gave us that thing and that was a very important uh, achievement in astronomy and so the point here is that without uh, instruments without observations astronomy is severely limited okay and that is the key thing here when we are going into gravitational waves astronomy now that was just the beginning and then as i was talking about initially uh, i was saying this about this visible thing right this is the optical where galileo did the observations and we were using our uh, normal eyes to see the stars but there are these all these windows of astronomy and you are this winter school is about this radio astronomy then the microwave infrared and you can see the scales also and radio is like these buildings and then in between somewhere it's a human scale and so on okay so we have made instruments in all these uh, frequencies and this was the telescope which galileo used in optical and now these are the twin keck uh, telescopes these are the biggest telescopes right now <coughs> operating uh, i think still the biggest uh, then the hubble space telescope chandra x ray observatory swift gamma ray um, swift x ray gamma ray i mean it is observing uh, gamma ray bursts then there is this uh, satellite called planck it is observing the cosmic microwave background and most of you probably have seen this picture i guess in this school at least <laughs> uh, but and then what what did we do with all these instruments so what do we know about astronomy right now we have a very good picture of the solar system we know where exactly the planets are we have very high precision information about those all the comets and so on this is very nice picture of the solar system we know how the galaxy looks like okay uh, it has spiral arms and um, you know the bulge is a very good uh, picture of the galaxies then we have this uh, slow and digital sky survey which gives a, give us a another 3d look deep view of the universe we know that the universe is nearly homogeneous and isotropic and then you can see this uh, the, each dot on this picture is actually a galaxy and uh, uh, this, this color is representing the density so basically you can see from this that it's pretty fairly homogeneous and isotropic this is a slice of the universe when you were looking at it i mean anyway it doesn't matter that much but basically this is to say that we have a very good idea of the broad structure of the universe then there are some other uh, interesting objects like the supernova remnant uh, crab nebula and uh, gravitational lensing probably you have heard about this too that when there is a massive object like uh, no longer travels in a straight path it bends okay now all these things look obvious today when you are sitting here in the classroom and then looking at this you are thinking like what is the big deal but just imagine 400 years ago no one would have even imagined that a galaxy has spiral arms okay so this is how our astronomy observation astronomy changed uh, our uh, perspective and understanding of the universe but this is not why astronomy is so interesting astronomy is interesting because of the surprises uh, so initially so those the previous
this light showed some of the things which are kind of understood that there are galaxies because people could see Andromeda galaxies in I think in villages or dark areas you can see but the proper structures were not known. We see planets, solar system, everything. But the surprises are the ones which are, which are much more interesting in astronomy, like pulsars. You know what pulsars are, because you must have been told about them. When they were first discovered, people thought that some aliens are sending signals to the Earth, okay? It was so much unknown. And this was one of the biggest surprises. Then there is this huge jet in uh, one of the ATNs, um, M87, okay? Then, this is one of the pictures you probably have seen because somebody, some guy got a Nobel Prize uh, recently uh, for uh, showing that the universe is accelerating. That is, of course, a big discovery because we did not know the universe is accelerating. Uh, people saw, I mean, observed supernova and then said that, and that created this whole new, um, not created, but con confirmed this whole new field of uh, dark energy and so on. But even before that, long before that, when people actually discovered, Hubble, even Hubble discovered that the universe is expanding, that was also another big, big discovery. People did not understand, knew, know that the universe is expanding, right? It's a huge discovery, big surprise. And then the cosmic microwave background. And you know that this, this is the remnant of this early universe uh, uh, big bang, probably. And the universe was extremely hot in early days, and then the, those uh, uh, radiation uh, are still coming to us, but at a cooler temperature because of the expansion of the universe and since it became much more, uh, m uh, much less dense, uh, the temperature went down and it is at 3 Kelvin. Uh, but the fluctuations here tell us all about the, I mean, many things about the early, very early universe. And this was also another serendipitous discovery. And all these things are so interesting now, the exciting fields of astronomy, but they were never, uh, never predicted before. Okay? Okay, so this is basically, uh, my introduction to observational uh, astronomy. So now, um, rest of the talk, I think we have spent 10 minutes on this. Now the rest of the talk will be, will slowly move to gravitational waves, okay? But the key thing there is that, obs why observation is so important. Now let us come to uh, classical non relativistic fundamental physics of those early days, let's say before 1900. So what was the situation? Fundamental laws of physics are the same in on inertial frames, okay? This was basically uh, Galilean relativity and there is this key word inertia but we will not get into those things now. Um, and then Newton's laws describe the dynamics of particles, you know all Newton's three laws etc. Newton's law of gravitation explained the Kepler's law of planetary motion, this is of course observational, that Kepler saw that the, how the planets are moving and Newton's law of gravitation uh, can explain that. Maxwell's equation along with uh, Lorentz force law describes electrodynamics. And then there are thermodynamics, uh, uh, which would be uh, described pretty well by Boltzmann principles and other laws. But this was basically the picture of physics uh, uh, earlier than that. But uh, in physics, we always ask questions and try to find errors. And then that leads to more advancement, right? So even in that picture, even though we could explain all the physical phenomena, there were problems, okay? Explain all the physical phenomena meaning whatever we were uh, observing at that point. So what was the problem? First of all, moving magnet and conductor problem. You know, like if there is a conductor, like a uh, loop, and then you have a magnet, you are moving the magnet around that conductor, there is current in that. Now you take the conductor and move around the magnet, still there will be, it will be the same thing, right? But then you could not, people could not explain this same phenomena uh, in the same framework. That means you needed two different laws to explain these, uh, uh, these effects, okay? And um, also, the Michelson Morley experiment, that is the other thing. That Michelson and Morley put, <coughs> created this interferometer, and they were trying to measure the velocity of uh, light as the earth rotates and so on. For a long time they observed and they could not find any deviation from the velocity of uh, light in vacuum, which we know, like C, okay? They found that from any reference frame, the velocity of light turns out to be C. And then people try to explain these things with, in different ways, but nothing worked. But Einstein was very smart. He believed the experiments. He said that, okay, if velocity, is light is, velocity of light is constant in every uh, frame, then velocity of light is constant in every frame, okay? Now, how do you achieve that? Basically, you have to change the, the clock in every frame, right? And that's what he did. So, he just said that every inertial frame has its own clock, and then the 
how they are connected is given by Lorentz transformation equation. So that that was essentially special relativity. Okay, uh, but then special relativity also was not general. That means special relativity. Uh, uh, so basically, people needed a another framework, uh, a special relativistic framework for gravity, gravitation. So Newton's law of gravity is like a is a partial and slightly inaccurate theory. Uh, so why is it? Uh, I mean, what is the big main problem? Let's say it is instantaneous. Okay. For example, if you uh, you know that if the uh, art, I mean you know Earth is going around the sun, but suppose you just take away sun, you just annihilate sun by some magical means, Earth will immediately start traveling in a straight path. It is like if you take a stone, you tie a rope, you start rotating it and then you just cut the stone. As if it starts uh, going in a straight path immediately, it does not happen even with a stone. But in general, in uh, Newtonian uh, relativity, uh, it does. So basically, Earth knew that the sun has disappeared in no time, instantaneously. That means that information propagated at infinite speed, okay, which is not relativistic. Which relativity does not allow such a thing. If relativity has a uh, maximum velocity of propagation, okay, uh, information propagation. So then Einstein uh, proposed the general relativity, which not only was a better theory than uh, Newton's laws, Newton's uh, gravity. That means it had a relativistic framework. Um, it has a finite uh, propagation, uh, information propagation speed and so on. But also it was more accurate. For example, when people observe this motion of perihelion of uh, planets across uh, uh, with stars, that means the planets orbit slightly move, they could realize that this is a better theory, this is a more accurate theory. Okay? Even that was true for special relativity. Like Newton's laws are valid only at the low velocity limit. At higher speeds, uh, Newton's law would fail. But once these theories came, people started more and more observations and then they confirmed that. But general relativity also predicted some uh, exciting objects. One of them is called the black holes. That you must have read in some newspapers, at least. So black holes are objects where uh, the space-time is so curved that even light cannot come out. So what does it mean? So the essence of general relativity is that uh, this is like this is a famous quote by someone called Wheeler, who is the uh, advisor of uh, Feynman. Um, this is PhD's advisor. So he said that space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to curve. Okay. So this is basically the idea of general relativity. So what is curved space-time? Now, curved space-time means that if you draw uh, two straight lines on, let's say, on a flat table, they never meet. Okay, but if you are trying to do it on the sphere, then they do meet. Okay, so that means the space. The this is a two-dimensional space. A sphere is a two-dimensional space. Okay, so there, uh, so a two-dimensional on a two-dimensional curved space, parallel lines are no longer parallel. And if you try to draw a triangle, you will see. I mean, I'll show a picture later on uh, that the angles are angles of a triangle. The sum of the angles of a triangle is no longer uh, 180 degrees. It can be like as big as 270 degrees and so on. Okay, so basically the thing is that on uh, on a curved space time, the general uh, flat space time uh, ideas would not work. But Einstein uh, um, basically learned this mathematics and then he came up with this theory, which worked uh, very well. So one of the thing is that that light. I mean, since if the space time is curved, light need not travel in a Euclidean straight line. Okay. That means when you connect two points, normally we have the idea that that straight line, we perceive straight line in a certain way. But if we need not perceive straight lines in that way because <coughs> things are curved. So, so the definition of straight line would be the shortest distance. For example, if you put a lens, there is one source here and if there is a uh, screen here, you know that the light is actually taking the extremal path, right? So it is sort of like that. Anyway, that also leads to um, uh, lensing and so on. So uh, that, that is one thing that black holes are so curved that light cannot come out. The other thing is that uh, general relativity predicts gravitational waves. These are the waves which carry that information. Okay, like for example, if you have a charged particle and it is accelerating or oscillating, 
let's say it's like a dipole, then it is emitting electromagnetic radiation. I think these things will be taught in your masters or something, but that is how photons are generated or electromagnetic wave is generated and you observe them, okay? Uh, maybe some of you already have uh, learned that, that accelerated charged particles emit uh, electromagnetic radiation. So similarly, if you have uh, accelerated asymmetric mass, then they emit gravitational waves, okay? Uh, for different reasons, gravitational waves, I mean different reasons, basically the reason is that it's because of conservation of uh, linear momentum, <coughs> gravitational waves are generated by varying quadrupole moment, whereas electromagnetic waves are generated by varying dipole moment. Okay. So what are the, uh, what is the nature of gravitational waves? What are gravitational waves? Um, as I told you already that gravitational waves are the uh, objects or whatever which carry this information from one point to another point, the gravitational information, okay? Um, and then it also propagates at the velocity of light in vacuum, that is C, okay? Gravitational waves, we interact very weakly with matter. And it has one bad thing and one good thing. The bad thing is that gravity in general is a weak force. So gravitational waves interact with weak matter, which means that it is very difficult to detect. So why gravity is a weak force? As you know that this cup, for example, is uh, attracted by the whole earth, okay? But my hand can lift it <coughs> using some <coughs> electromagnetic interactions here in the muscles which means that electromagnetic force is much stronger than gravitational force. Um, but then, uh, you can detect electromagnetic waves using small dipoles. Okay, you will get some signal. But since they are weak, it is very difficult to detect gravitational waves. Okay, it is extremely difficult to detect gravitational waves. And we will come to that, that how, how difficult it is. But the good thing is that, that since they interact very weakly with matter, they can travel long distances without getting distorted. So for example, when there is a black hole, let's say in a galaxy, which is surrounded by dust, photons cannot travel straight to us because it is always getting scattered. You can see something when photons come straight to your eyes, right? That's why in, on foggy nights, you cannot see the car on, in the front. It is not like the photons are all lost. I mean, where will they go? They are still there. But they are just not coming straight to your eyes. Uh, so, if we can observe gravitational waves, we can get information about objects which are not visible in electromagnetic astronomy. And that is the, uh, that is the main motivation for gravitational waves research. And huge worldwide effort is ongoing to detect gravitational waves, okay? So, what are gravitational waves? They are like tidal waves, okay? Uh, I will not go into that. But one, one thing you should see is that this is, uh, see, Gravitational waves are basically changing the curvature of space-time, uh, space basically becoming negative and positive. That's all it is doing. So basically on a flat curvature, you have this triangle, which whose uh, sum of the angles is 180 degree. But when gravitational waves fall on it, the angles increase and decrease. Now how? So let's say you consider the Earth, you take, it's a, basically a 2D uh, curved space-time, and you uh, draw two parallel lines, let's say two longitudes at the equator. At the equator you can imagine, you can, I mean, if you visualize, all the um, longitude lines are parallel, right? Because they are all meeting this equator orthogonally, they are at 90 degrees. Now, you take two of them, let's say, uh, one at uh, latitude 0, one at latitude 90, okay? Then what will happen is that they will come like this and meet at the pole at 90 degrees. So now you created a triangle on the curved space time which is whose sum of angles is 270 degree instead of 180 degree. Okay? If you think about it, you will, it is very easy to see. There are 390 degrees in this triangle. And then if you uh, can imagine a saddle like this, then you can create angles which are smaller than uh, 180 degrees. So basically, the, this table will help you in understanding what are the best, I mean, to link uh, gravitational waves to electromagnetic waves, okay? So basically, both travel in space. So space is basically the medium. The source of gravitational uh, electromagnetic waves is incoherent superposition of atoms and molecules, generally, except for radio uh, 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 astronomy. So basically, when you are looking at, for example, this projector, this projector is emitting photons which are not coherent, they are incoherent. 
the phase is not preserved, okay? But for gravitational waves, these huge objects emit gravitational waves, okay? I mean, like, let's say, two compact stars which are very close to uh, each other and going around each other. That is the full system which is emitting gravitational waves, okay? It's like a dumbbell or something. So the phase is preserved. So it is phase coherent. Uh, that is a big difference. Um, so, and then uh, this resolution part you can e skip because it depends on the frequency and so on. Uh, the interaction I told you already, that photons interact much more, uh, 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 much at, at a much higher rate than uh, gravitational waves, gravitons or gravitational waves. Uh, so detection. So generally, in electromagnetic astronomy, we measure power, that is we count photons, okay? But in radio astronomy, you actually measure amplitude. That is a difference. And gravitational is also, we measure amplitude. So this is some kind of similarity with radio. And uh, electromagnetic waves also, generally, the detectors are directional, but not always. For example, I don't know if you were told about LOFAR, I mean, some, some arrays, dipole, uh, omnidirectional antennas, which can be like software uh, uh, combined or like, you know, cross correlated to give you a direction and so on. So, generally gravitational waves are also omnidirectional antennas. That means they accept signals from almost every direction. Not all directions because if you are, I mean, looking at the perpendicular, I mean, on the plane where the detectors are, then probably you would not see anything. But in general, okay? Anyway, we, these are not, the, I mean, these are basically some connections between electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves. So, the most uh, promising signals for uh, gravitational waves are the compact binary coalescence. So two compact stars going around each other would emit gravitational waves. That is predicted by general relativity. And typically, their amplitude and uh, frequency both increase with time. That's why they are called chirp signals. Now, this part is called the inspiral part, the first part, okay, when they are going around each other. They lose energy in that when they emit gravitational waves. So as you know, if two, uh, I mean the energy, the binding energy of a two-body uh, system goes down when they come close. Okay, this will be probably. I think these have been taught in your uh, central force and so on. So uh, then their energy goes down, and then they come close. Their period goes up. So that's why the, the period period goes down. The frequency goes up. Okay. So you can see that amplitude is lesser than, than here, lesser here than here, okay? Uh, that, and this is the time axis. So yeah, amplitude is increasing with time, and the frequency is decreasing, that, uh, increasing. See, the wavelength is decreasing. Wavelength here is bigger than here. So these are, typically if you uh, he, analyze birds' chirps, okay? Then the signal is like this. So that's why these are called chirp signals. But then the most uh, interesting and messy phase, when they, these two objects actually merge, okay, to form one single black hole or compact object, most likely black hole. At that point, analytical calculations are very difficult, and people need, uh, use numerical relativity to model this phase. But this is the most interesting phase, because these calculations have to be extremely precise, and then it will be a big test of general relativity. If our understandings are correct, then our prediction of this complicated waveform would actually match the observation. And, and if it matches, then only uh, we can detect. Otherwise, we would not be able to detect. And then the ring down, that's like uh, the, the newly formed black hole sort of settles down. Okay? So I'll show you a small animation where you can see what is going on. So these are the two objects, uh, two black holes essentially. So these are some space time diagrams. But so as you can see, they are slowly going around each other, and here the is shown like where they are, and this is a chirp signal. But there's a big skip to show you to the I mean, forward to the interesting part, and now the messy numerical relativity part is there was a pause, and then again it shows a ring down. Yes. So this is basically what is happening, and typically, uh, strength of a uh, gravitational wave is measured in strains. Because when gravitational waves fall on some object, basically what happens is that it length changes slightly. Okay, so and the change is proportional to the length. 
So basically, if there is an object like uh, of length l, its length will change by delta l. And you know, in uh, in your elasticity, uh, delta l by l is called the strain. Okay. So the strain produced by gravitational waves uh, is normally generated by this thing h is of the order of 10 to the minus 21 or less. Okay. In a very optimistic situation, it will be minus 21. Generally, it will be minus 10 to the minus 23 for uh, to have a significant probability of detection. Now, 10 to the minus 23 strain, you can imagine, is extremely small. Uh, first of all, of course, it depends on the L itself. Now, let's say if we use a few kilometer arm, let's say if we have a de detector which is 4 kilometer long. If the strain is 10 to the minus 21, then you can see the the distance you have to measure, the delta L, would be of the order of 10 to the minus 18 or less. And that is smaller than a new size of a nucleus. Okay, So we are trying to measure distances which are smaller than the size of a nucleus to detect gravitational waves. Okay, And it has been possible to detect, uh, to measure distances of that order, but not yet, we have, we have not yet detected gravitational waves. So what are the sources of gravitational waves? Uh, I mean the most promising was compact binary coalescence, I told you before. Then there is supernova. I mean if the supernova explosion has some asymmetry, uh, you know what supernova is? So when the, a star reaches its end stages, it explodes and that is uh, emitting huge amount of energy. It, the energy is emitted in electromagnetic waves, neutrinos and gravitational waves. And that is, uh, uh, so the gravitational waves part can be detect, uh, I mean, there is a chance that it can be detected. Um, so, and yeah, so that is, that is called one kind of burst signal. Then there are gamma ray bursts which, are we, which you observe and people don't know what uh, uh, generates these gamma ray bursts, okay. Uh, then there are continuous sources, sources which are always emitting gravitational waves. It is, this, these are like pulsars, okay. Very precise clocks, they are emitting gravitational waves at a constant frequency and uh, you can detect them uh, by integrating over a long time. Even though these uh, sources are very weak, you can observe for a long time and uh, uh, get some uh, uh, data detection. So these sort of sources are pulsars, magnetars, rapidly spinning neutron stars, low mass extra binaries and all those things. And then of course supermassive black hole binaries. These are em emitting huge amount of energy uh, but then they are at a lower frequency. We, our detectors right now are at like 100 hertz and so on. <clears throat> so these things may not be detected at this point. This will require a space-based uh, detector. Then there are stochastic sources, which are like collection of these sources, but better we keep this thing. Um, so what is the situation of gravitational wave astronomy? I think I'll just come to this slide now. So basically, we are sort of near to the first telescope. It is, we still have not detected anything, but our situation is like the first primitive telescope. Okay? It took almost 400 years uh, in electromagnetic astronomy to grow from here to this state today. Okay? 400 years. Okay? Now technology has improved and things are moving faster than before, as always. So we may be able to achieve these sort of goals, that means measure, uh, setting up gravity wave detectors at every frequency and so on, much faster, but still the 400 years cannot become like 4 years. It will take at least 100, I mean maybe 40, 100 years, okay? Uh, all, we have already spent 30 years in building this one, which took probably some infinite time or something you can say, because people have been observing the stars for centuries and then at some point this was possible. Um, and in gravitational waves also there are many sources. It's a full spectrum. The, this is wavelength and this is strain. Uh, what is important to understand is that at different wavelengths there are different signals. For example, the neutron star, neutron star merger signal would be here. Then black hole binaries would be somewhere here. And then there will be, as you go higher in mass, uh, you go to lower uh, uh, frequencies, okay? That is higher wavelength. For some reason, 
uh, the wavelength is decreasing along this axis. And then there are this cosmological background from early universe, uh, which is called inflation there. So one connection to radio astronomy is the multi-messenger astronomy. <coughs> so different uh, uh, windows of astronomy and gravitational waves and neutrinos uh, observatories, they are planning to observe the sky together, okay? So that, uh, to, for two reasons, first, to get much more confidence on your detector. For example, there is something, some source, that means which we call events, basically. Let's say there is some event which was detected in gravitational waves detector, okay? And then, you see where it happened, and if you observe something interesting at the same position, at the, almost at the same time, uh, with a, uh, another uh, electromagnetic uh, observatory, let's say some telescope or something, then you know that something, this is a genuine signal. It is not some uh, instrumental artifact or, uh, let's say, uh, a glitch in the instrument, okay? You know that that is a genuine signal. That gives you the con more confidence. But also, the more interesting thing is that, let's say we detect is something from a given direction. And then we immediately give send this information to the optical or radio and all these observatories, saying that we have seen something there, please point your telescope to that direction, okay? And they point their telescope and then they observe those objects and they can get a very early light curves. For example, this is a big problem in, for example, supernova many um, analysis that when people start observing, the source has already passed through a certain uh, time. So, but if you can detect things early, then you can tell people to observe, start observing pretty early. And what kind of uh, science can you do with that? I mean, for example, what kind of information you will uh, get? So, we, I told you that general relativity always says, uh, um, predicts that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. But we tend to question everything. Now we want to test if general relativity is correct, right? So we have to say, uh, we have to prove that gravitational waves also travel at the speed of light. Otherwise there is, that theory has to be modified. So let's say you see a source at a certain time, and then you know that since light also travels at the speed of light, uh, the other optical observatories should also see the event exactly at the same time, right? So that will tell you whether these two have the same speed. Uh, then uh, this thing I told, uh, I think I just skip most of this, okay? Because we have to finish a bit faster. Now, um, what are the important challenges in astronomy and cosmology right now? Is Einstein's general relativity correct? I mean, so far all the experiments have shown that this theory is correct, but then you always have to do experiments to know how much it is correct. That means at which limit it breaks um, or does it break at all. Then we have talked about black holes. We have said that there is something called event horizon beyond which uh, uh, light cannot, I mean, light cannot cross the event horizon. From outside it can, but from not from inside, okay? But does it actually exist in uh, nature? How exactly the universe is expanding? Of course, there is, a, we know roughly how it is, but then if we, with gravitational waves observatory, we may uh, increase our horizon. Was there a cosmological inflation? Inflation is one of the big pillars of the Big Bang cosmology, okay? Big Bang theory requires uh, a phase where universe expanded extremely rapidly. But there is no proof, observational proof for inflation so far. So can we prove that? And gravitational waves are emitted during this phase, okay? If we can detect those gravitational waves, then we would be able to confirm. I mean, with the proper signature and so on. So gravitational wave astronomy can partially and completely address all of the above issues. That's, uh, that makes it uh, very exciting because many of those questions cannot be answered directly with electromagnetic astronomy. For example, you cannot observe a black hole with electromagnetic astronomy because black holes don't emit any photons. Um, but I will again skip these slides. Um, we'll better go to another one. But there are many science cases like what you, what kind of astrophysics you can do with this, uh, uh, with gravitational waves, cosmology, fundamental physics, and so on. But then, as I showed before, long time back, uh, when I was showing you this different observatories, electromagnetic observatories, that we had this nice structure of galaxies, solar systems, and all these things. But that is not the most exciting thing. Most exciting things were pulsars, cosmic micro background, expanding universe, and so on. And those things were not predicted. You don't know what is coming. 
and those make uh, those things make one window of astronomy most interesting. And those are the surprises. And obviously, one cannot talk about surprises. They come, they are discovered, and people, some people will get Nobel prizes and so on. But those surprises are the ones which will make uh, life so exciting. Now, what is the status of detection of gravitational waves? We know that we know indirectly gravitational waves exist. So, general theory of relativity predicts that. I mean, I explained again. Uh, so that uh, this binary, uh, you know, compact collision binaries, they go around each other, they come close, their period reduces. Okay, frequency increases. So there is this binary system, Hulse and Tel uh, Hulse Teller binary system, which is which has a astronomical name, PSR 1913 plus 16 and so on. So it was observed for 30 years, and how the uh, period is reducing was it measured with very high precision. And uh, these dots are observations. You can see it is the measurements were done from 1970 um, something to 2000. And it matches, matched the general relativity uh, predictions extremely well. So from that, you know that the theory is correct. It is like saying that, uh, let's say you know electromagnetic theory. You know that a hot object would emit a certain radiation. Okay. Your theory says that if uh, it is a pure black body, it emits, it is emitting Planck spectrum, then if you integrate, you should get Stefan Boltzmann law of cooling. And now you have, you cannot count photon. Like we cannot observe gravitational waves. Let's say you cannot count photons. Okay, but you have a thermometer, so you can see how the temperature should fall. And you know if Stefan Boltzmann law is correct. That is Planck law is correct. Stefan Boltzmann law is correct. How exactly the cup of tea should cool? Okay. Now you take your measurements with the thermometer and show that it is exactly following that. Then you immediately know that most probably, I mean, there is a very high chance that your previous theory, original theory, is actually correct, even though you cannot count photons. So this is the uh, proof that we have right now that gravitational waves exist. But we need to go for direct detection. So what will happen if gravitational waves fall on an object? I said that it will have some stress, right? I mean, to exhibit some strain, yeah. Now, the best way to measure small distances is using a Michelson's interferometer. So, which has two arms like this, one here and one here. There is a laser light which is shown on this, uh, uh, one of the beam splitters. It splits the light in two parts. One, uh, one beam goes, hits a mirror here, comes back. The other beam goes and it, uh, this way. If the mirror comes back, if the path length is the same, then you will uh, see a dark fringe here because of uh, phase change due to uh, reflection from rear to tensor medium. Uh, so, but if there is a difference in path length, then the instrument shows a slightly bright fringe. Okay, that means it is trying to go to a brighter fringe, and that can be detected to a very, very high precision, okay. That even, I mean, if when it is at the dark fringe, it should be almost dark, okay, almost because there is always some quantum and many other noise. But a small change should be detectable, and it is detected at a very high precision, and that is the whole uh, game of how measuring uh, 10 to the minus 18 uh, meters, okay. Uh, so, basically, initially, the, this attempt started long time ago, like 50 years ago. John uh, Joe Weber created the bar, a resonant bar detector. It's basically, a big piece of metal on which gravi if gravitational waves fall in its given frequency, then it will um, given frequency meaning near the resonance frequency, then the bar will resonate, and you can get uh, uh, you can detect the movement in the bar. Okay, and that will give you some detection of gravitational waves. But that has that is, uh, that was not very successful because the sensitivity is very weak. Uh, but the effect is still on. People are trying to create uh, spherical detectors which will have sensitivity in every direction and uh, that cool cryogenically. That means reduce the temperature so that the quantum noise goes down. Quantum noise is a very important in uh, when you are trying to measure 10 to the minus 18 meters because the heat in the system, the Brownian motion created by those will, um, uh, will create more fluctuations 
than what you had. So you have to always uh, try to reduce quantum noise. So this is the current uh, uh, most sensitive detector we have. Uh, there is a pair of them basically. So this is the LIGO Hanford Observatory. Um, it has two arms. This is actually a huge Michelson interferometer. Each arm is four kilometers long. Okay. It operates uh, in a frequency range 10 to um, about 2 kilohertz basically uh, window. Um, the first generation sensitivity was 10 to the minus 22. That means it could measure strain higher than 10 to the minus 22. And then there will be the advanced detector whose sensitivity would be about 10 to the minus 23. That is one order of magnitude more. That is very important. Now there is one more in Louisiana like that. Actually there are two detectors here. Uh, halfway through, also there was one more detector. I mean, there was a mirror even at this distance. This this is the end point. This is four kilometers, and at two kilometers also there was uh, another uh, mirror which made a two kilometer detector also. But for the second generation upgrade, it was initially decided that this mirror will also be put here. So there will be two four kilometer arm interferometer at the same site. Okay, but that plan has changed. I tell you how it has got changed. Uh, so, this is basically the design, again I just uh, uh, make one comment here, to reduce all this uh, photon short noise for example, you have to have very high energy photons, because you know the photon short noise goes as square root of n, that if you are detecting n photons, the error in detecting n photons is generally square root of n, okay, that means a frac fractional error is square root of n by n, that is 1 by square root of n. So if you have more photons, uh, if you are trying to detect more photons, then you would have uh, less error. So that's why the uh, in LIGO, there is a 10 watt laser uh, to start with, and the power becomes 15 kilowatt in the cavities. Okay? These are fabric pedal cavities. I'm not sure if you know what fabric pedal cavities are, but they, this whole system is a hierarchy of fabric pedal cavities. That means there is one cavity here, one cavity here, then all this, this, this whole system is used as another cavity using another mirror here, so this also resonates and so on. Um, so, but this is the, this probably, this is probably more understandable. So what is shown here is the noise in the detector. So this is the frequency of uh, axis. And if you integrate it, if you observe for one second, then how much noise you would observe is plotted here. What does it mean is that, and this axis is the strain axis. If you can, if you see here, let's say around 200 hertz, the detector almost reaches 10 to the minus uh, 20, uh, 2 into 10 to the minus 23. Okay. So what does it mean? It means that if there was a signal at 10 to the minus 23 level, let's say here, you would not be able to detect with this detector because the noise in the detector is more than that. Okay? Uh, and here also there are different light, uh, colors show how the noise ever evolved because you want lesser noise in the system. So this curve should come here, then it becomes you would be able to observe sources. I mean this is much more general than gravitational observatory anything. Any detector, anything which detects has this sort of curves. So uh, basically every detector in the world, whatever we have made, has a finite bandwidth, that means it op operates only in a given frequency rate and with a given sensitivity. And this plot uh, appears more often for LIGO, but this is true for any uh, detector. And then you can see that the green line, which was about 100, uh, two orders of magnitude less, um, was in September 2002. And in 10 years, slowly people have worked and hard, and then brought it down here. More you go down, harder it becomes to push it more down. So 2002 to 2003, okay, took one year. Uh, this red to uh, green to red took one year. Then you can see in another year you go. I mean this distance reduces basically. That it, it is like scoring um, 80 is much easier than uh, I mean scoring 80 is slightly harder than scoring 60, but then Scoring 90 is almost equally harder, even though you are increasing only 10, it becomes more hard, and then 95 becomes almost as equally hard, and so on. And scoring 100 out of 100 becomes extremely hard. 
There is one more detector called Virgo. This is in uh, Pisa, uh, Italy, where Galileo did his famous uh, experiment. Uh, so it is close to that. Okay. Um, so that is three kilometer long. Now, since the detector has too much noise, we have to use the known features of the source, a model of the source, in order to detect it. Okay. And that we use something called the match filtering to do that. Basically, again, I will just keep this because it, it, this may um, become a bit boring. But the thing is that you, if you can, if you know the pattern, exact pattern of the signal, then you can. It is much easier to find that pattern in noise. I mean, let's say here there is this uh, chirp signal which is mixed with the noise. You cannot see it here because this, these are much stronger. The noise is much more than this. Okay then you can use something called mass filtering to extract that signal by cross correlating. But since it's a radio astronomy school, I'll show one of the techniques which we use, which is called a GW radiometer, where uh, data from two detectors are correlated with a phase delay uh, for, a, for each given direction. So suppose you want to make a map of a given direction, you take signal from those uh, uh, signals are anyway, the detectors are only direction, so you cannot like rotate them. Signals are always coming, but you adjust the phase delay and uh, integrate over time for days, okay? And then you can, you will see that only one direction gets coherently added, but the others don't, okay? That's, that's how you can make a map of the sky. So, but we have not detected any signals yet. The reason is that, even though we have reached a level where we can measure less than 10 to the minus 18, the the distance which we can go uh, up to that for, let's say, to observe uh, neutron star, neutron star coalescence is, uh, okay, the distance is not written in this table, the rate is 0 0.02 per year. That means that at this current sensitivity, the probability of, of observing a neutron star, neutron star binary is 0 0.02 in one year. So, which is obviously very small because this has to be a number or integer if you want to detect it. So, then we will, uh, if we can reduce the sensitivity by one order of magnitude, I mean increase the sensitivity, that is reduce the noise level, then it becomes 40 per year. Now, why improving the sensitivity by one order of magnitude, that is by a factor of 10, improves this so much? Because, because of the fact that, let me just keep this. The volume goes as the cube of R. So if you reduce the sensitivity by one order of magnitude, that means you are going 10, a uh, factor of 10 further, the volume covered is factor of uh, 1000 more, okay? So then 0 0.02 into 1000 would become 20, right? Uh, 2 by 100, yeah, uh, 200 actually. But then there are other considerations, so because of the bandwidth and so on. It is basically normally the factor is actually 1. 1500. But you can see the idea that this is the, the there is a purple round thing here that was the initial LIGO sensitivity and the second generation which is called the ultraviolet LIGO has this huge sphere. Okay. Um, and then people are already planning third generation detectors which would be uh, so this red one is the first generation LIGO one, green is the second generation and this blue is the third generation detector which has even one order of magnitude more sensitivity for doing astrophysics, not just detection. And this is the plan, you can actually go underground to reduce noise even more. And then there are like space space detectors which are being, uh, which are also under uh, kind of uh, proposal come development and so on. They are, uh, this is the sun, this is the earth, and three satellites separated by millions kilometer arm length would follow the earth. This is the earth and these satellites would follow. They will extend the lasers, and by measuring the path length difference, you can detect gravitational waves. That is the basic idea. Okay. Uh, so I mean, there are different countries which are, who are proposing this. There is one proposed by the Japanese. I mean, the other one was NISA, which is in a different situation. But then there is a Japanese one which has more promise. It's called the Desi Heart Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory. So you go. This is going to probe the gravitational waves from inflation, that is from the early universe. 
Then there is Big Bang Observer, which would be a grand uh, a detector. It's a set of many, many detectors, I mean, some set of this, all these standards, some 12 detectors or something. It's going to have a huge uh, uh, sensitivity. Even though this is, it looks like 10 to the minus 24, but it is at a much lower frequency. At lower frequency, the sources are very strong. So it's a very, very strong detector. Uh, but then, right now, the first aim is to have a network of ground-based interferometric gravitational detectors. And as you, I told you, that there are two sites in LIGO where there were three detectors, two in Hanford and one in uh, Louisiana. Uh, then there is the Marco detector in Italy. There is a Tama detector and then there is uh, something called Kagra, which is coming up in Japan. There is a Geo detector, it's a small detector in Germany. Uh, and then, but uh, but two detectors in one site has different uh, problems. I mean, because they have correlated noise and so on. So one detector, and the and also the resolution at which you can localize sources. Let's say there is a source, and you want to localize the other part. I mean, you want to know where it happened, okay? And then you want to tell the other electromagnetic uh, observer uh, telescopes that okay, look there. Now, when you say look there, if you have a very high resolution antenna. You cannot just say, okay, look at a 10 degree by 10 degree patch. It will be very difficult for them to find out something. You need something very, very precise in a very small solid angle. So you need a detector which is far away. In, the, in this school, you definitely have learned about lambda by d, that if you have a, a detector separated by a significant baseline, then you can have higher uh, angular resolution. So one of these detectors could be moved to one of the other places, okay? And the best place seems to be a region near the, um, uh, around the Indian Ocean, okay? Now first, initially people are thinking about Australia, but India had a very good history of gravity wave research and so on. So there is a very high chance that one detector will be moved to India. And then uh, we'll get the basic instruments, okay? I mean, of course, there is no site in India. And the vacuum and these things were already set up there. So we'll have to do most of the things. Uh, uh, most of the vacuum and all these things, we'll just get the laser, for example, and uh, those things from uh, US, Germany, and all these places, and we can have a, our own detector. Uh, so, I, mean, I, I told you already that this is the source localization error with, uh, without the Indian detector. There is two detectors in uh, Hanford, uh, Hanf one LIGO and one Fargo. And these circles represent how big uh, is the error in determining the sources. Big error meaning this is huge, uh, need, uh, huge areas, okay? This uh, process means that you cannot determine the source properly here. And then this is with uh, the indigo detector, Indian detector. And you can see that the errors are much, much smaller. So you can have a reasonable um, accuracy. I mean, there are many other parameters which are there. I mean, figures of merit by which you can determine how good the a detector in India would be. But this is basically the uh, uh, thing. So what is the summary? The astronomy is severely limited without the observation that I showed with all those slides. And gravitational astronomy promises a whole new window of astronomy. If we expect to know and confirm a lot about interesting objects like black holes, but then the surprises are the key things here, which we don't know about. Worldwide effort is ongoing to develop detectors, analysis, signal models, and many things. I mean, there, is, there are almost 1,000 people working on this project. Uh, so you can imagine how big it is. It's like particle physics uh, detectors where huge amount number of people work. Uh, so efforts involving first generation detectors and remarkable success. We showed that we can detect 10 to the minus 18 uh, and less uh, distance. Uh, now, advanced and other future detectors are progressing rapidly so that we can actually detect something in the few, in few years, so that the probability of detection improves to at least few per year. Then there will be significant charts of detection. And India has now extended its participation also in the experimental side. So we may have a detector in India also. Um, so we are looking forward to another renaissance in astronomy like what happened in uh, Galileo's time. And if you want to get involved in these uh, initiatives, then you can go to uh, Indian Initiative, this website, Indian Initiative in Gravitational Observation, from Indigo. This, the website is www.indigo.org. There are many uh, things here. Uh, if you want to do a project or something, you can go to this Indigo Consortium on this website, see the 
uh, nearest neighbor for you and then talk to those persons and see I mean, if you want to uh, do something there. And then we also have a page on Facebook where you can go and like. Yeah, that's it. Questions now? Generally, uh, we expect that the instrument from which we are measuring some quantity, uh, yeah. it should be you know, uh, in the best position with respect to what we are measuring. So that, for example, if we are uh, measuring water ripples, mm -hmm. then we expect that in its frame of reference, this is something like, you know, uh, not necessarily. Okay, in, in our frame of reference, this should be addressed and that should be moved because we are we want to measure its movement related to us. Yeah. Uh, I mean, not so basically. So you you see that there is a relative velocity between the source and the wave, right? Uh, or the detector and the wave. There is always a. Yeah, I, I said that wrong. I I mean to say, in my frame of reference, my detector should be addressed, and that what I want to measure is like whatever it is. Yeah, you can always go to that frame, the detector but, frame. But the problem with the gravitational wave is it's something so universal that uh, once that wave comes, it's going to affect everything. Right? Yes, that's right. So how do we get out of this? You know, because our instruments and we too are will be you know affected by the same, and we will be having uncertainty. In the no, I mean, uh, oh, why? I mean, uh, basically, you have a detector. So basically there are different axes also. So the detector is in a given frame. Wave is coming and it is showing some kind of strain. Okay. Uh, let's say that uh, okay, let's say let's I have to give you some example, okay? <laughs> let's say that there is a stretching machine, okay, which is like okay, let's say you have like lot of iron in your body and there is a huge magnetic field which is oscillating and you are inside that magnetic field. You will feel the stress in your body, right? If suppose you are completely magnetized or polarized in some way and then you are being compressed and uh, extended by some magnetic field, you will feel that stress. We are trying to measure the tidal force. Gravity is a sort of force which you cannot remove. Now I did not get into that sort of thing. In general relativity, we will see that gravity is a force which is not removable. And that is the unique thing about gravity. So you can always measure it. And what we measure is scale is frame independent. It is a scalar. Especially in things like uh, my Michelson interferometry. So we are looking for the path difference to get differences. Yeah. So uh, we are assuming that these gravitational waves will make fluctuations and so strain will cause the path difference in laser light. Right. So if we are, if we go into that frame, I mean, will there be the, I mean, the laser light travels through space time. So the time dilation also will also take place in uh, that frame where it's being compressed. So will we should we expect the fringes because of that? No, no. You, you, you okay. So basically, so the gravitational waves are traveling perpendicular to the f uh, frame. Okay, uh, which actually means that there will not be any gravitational redshift there. But you need to do a lot of calculations to see. I mean, if it's, it's, you have to go to the right frame and so on. Uh, but generally we use a frame where uh, it's called the transverse stressless but anyway it does not really matter in a frame where the mirrors are kind of uh, not moving actually nothing moves in that frame only the metric uh, the distance changes it is like uh, let's say there are ants sitting on a ruler on each tick of the ruler okay and let's say now you start uh, moving the uh, ruler, okay, Ex I mean stretching the ruler and then compressing. So the ants would not actually move, they will, they are still stuck to those things, right? But now if they ex uh, exchange a laser light, they can see the distance between them, okay? Now your question is that, that whether the wavelength of light is going to change. No, it is not going to change. Uh, however, uh, if you, if your light, um, so the gravitational waves is passing at a certain rate, but the laser light travel time is much smaller. Okay, the gravitational wave frequency is much uh, lower. That means uh, it is changing very, very slowly. And the light is making many uh, distances, travel di distances, right? So the distance measurement 
would be pretty much accurate. You are basically measuring the distance. Okay, so you are trying to see.